Hello, I'm George Manker and I'm going to present my life and the way I would like to do it is to present it as a series of seven resets um, which occurred throughout my life and I will begin with the first reset which was in 1967 when I was six years old. Up until that time my parents had a shop in North Sydney. I was the only child. We had our friends of the family. I've had my own friends as a child and um, my mother who is Italian and had a family in Italy. My father was German and he had family in Germany. They decided in 1967 to sell their business in North Sydney and to go to Europe and spend a few months there. And the way we did that was we took a ship line, a ship voyage to Europe. And that was because my mother had a, a fear of flying at that stage. And there were still um, lines of passage by ship throughout the world, other than luxury cruises. So we took off from Sydney and we, we landed six to eight weeks later, I think, in the Bay of Naples, going via um, India, Bombay. I remember spending a day excursion there in Bombay with my parents. I was very, very scared with the mass of people everywhere. Uh, we went up through the Suez Canal. We saw all the Egyptian forces lined up against the Suez Canal um, just before the Six Day War. We were one of the last ships going through the Suez Canal and we ended up in Naples in 67 and we spent about six months in Europe. So that was quite a significant, huge break in my very young life. When we returned, we could not come through the Suez Canal anymore. So we had to go around Africa and we stopped in South Africa, Durban, and then we made our way back to Sydney. Now, that meant I missed out almost all of my year one schooling. And so when we returned to Australia, we returned to a different suburb, Coogee in the eastern suburbs. And we, um, I had to finish off year one starting October. And in fact, I actually did it quite well. So I didn't have to repeat or anything like that. But that was a reset because it was a different house, a new suburb, a new life, a new school, everything new. Um, all my childhood friends up to that stage, um, I completely lost contact with. Um, funnily enough, I am just recently made contact with one of those original pre-1967 um, friends. Um, Anyway, so that was the, the first major reset. Now, after 1967, my two sisters were born in 69 and 70. Um, so we had a um, completely different life. I had siblings, um, so everything was different. Um, going to the next reset, um, which was in 1979, up until that point, I was at school. I finished school in 1978. I did my HSC. I went to Waverley, lovely Catholic school. My mother insisted that I attend the Catholic school. Um, but what had happened, I went from being a very studious and um, obeying child to a bit of a rebel. Um, I remember in 1974, uh, well, 1972, I started smoking at the age of 11. 1974, I had a motorbike and I had rough friends. Um, I actually took my father's car for a joyride one night in 1974 and got pursued and arrested by the police, let off with a caution. Um, my father coming to the police station at three or four o'clock in the morning was um, a sight I still remember. Um, so in 1975, I stopped getting interested in motorbikes and I found, I discovered music. So I started playing the guitar and I started being interested in things which were not very practical, but were artistic. And up until that stage, I was very good at maths and science, etc. And so I found myself becoming more and more interested in things which were artistic, uh, new ideas, um, and also becoming a bit of a rebel. Um, started smoking pot, I suppose, like everybody else did. Um, and I wanted to you know, go and do my own thing, uh, essentially live freestyle. Uh, I didn't care about career. I almost asked my parents, well, I did ask my parents, I didn't want to do the HSC, but they forced me to, and um, I'm sort of glad I did. But when I left 
um, when I left school in 1978 and 1979, um, during 1979, within a matter of months, I met my first wife. Um, we moved in together. Uh, this was the beginning of 1979, and I got a full-time job, took a first year. Sorry, I took my first year outside of school off from university. I got into university to do an arts degree. I went to study philosophy and literature. I started getting interested in poetry. And essentially, I embarked um, into the world as independently and as quickly as possible without thinking what the future will bring. I just had a dream of becoming a writer or a musician, um, living alternatively. Um, uh, the only problem was is that I had to go and work to get money. And at that stage, all I can get were menial jobs, clerical jobs, working in kitchens, working in cafes and things like that. And then I realized the reality of such uh, a life and a lifestyle meant that you had to be a wage slave and be treated as such. And I really didn't like that. Um, but anyway, that's the way it was. That was my first reset and that was all going along pretty well. I started university in 1980. Um, I jumped around from subject to subject. I started subjects, I discontinued subjects, I did literature, I did linguistics, I did philosophy, I changed philosophy subjects. I started learning languages, I stopped learning languages. So I would, for me, university was just um, the typical Greek agora, walking around, talking to people um, between lectures and opening my mind and learning as much as possible and discovering the world. And I just dreamt of going overseas and going to all the wonderful museums and, and things like that. Anyway, but uh, I also was married in 1980 before my 19th birthday. Yes, before my 19th birthday, I got married um, and I hadn't told my parents. And I'd been living a year independently with my then wife. Um, and that was the major reset after doing school. So the third reset, is in 1986. So I ended up splitting up with my first wife, as you can imagine, in uh, very quickly in about 1982. I had another girlfriend. I moved in with her, moved out from her. I was floundering at university. I was starting things. And, and then I started getting a little bit sick of it all. Um, I went on the doll and did part-time university and told the then CES, which is now called Centrelink, that I was looking for work. And I did that for a few years. And I realized that I was just drifting along. I was 21, 22, and I wasn't feeling very fulfilled. So I was doing German at university, amongst other things. And I decided to go to Germany in 1985. And I got a job becoming a con an English conversation teacher in two German high schools in Munich for one year as part of a, an exchange experience. So that was pretty good. And uh, I just packed everything up. I put university on hold. Um, so I was about halfway through university, through university uh, halfway through a three-year bachelor's degree, when I'd just done about four or five years of university. So you can see I hadn't done very much, although I'd learnt a hell of a lot. Um, and I was divorced by that stage. So in 1985, I met my second wife. She was French. She was the French teacher in a high school where I was the English teacher. And we fell in love. We moved in with each other very quickly. Lived together in Munich for about six months. I traveled around Europe with her a little bit. And we decided to come back to Australia and start a life here. And when I'd met her and when I came to Australia and I brought her back to Australia with me, I decided to pull my socks up, don't discontinue being such a ne'er-do-well dreamer and not get so involved with things like philosophy and poetry and music. And I put all of that aside and I suppressed all that and I said so I was going to get serious. I went back, worked part-time, we got a place together. I went to university part-time. I finished off my university in 1989. Uh, I finally finished after nine years um, and I was doing the right thing. Um, the only thing was we didn't have any children. Um, she got a job here in, in Sydney. And in 1989, we decided to also go back to France where she needed to uh, finish finish her degree, if I remember rightly. She, had, she, was in the, she actually put her degree on hold. So we went back and said, let's live in France for a while to see how that works out. 
Um, even though I lived in France from 1989 until 1995, I really didn't like living there. I really didn't like living in France. I'd learned French, I'd learned a lot, um, and I did have a lot of good times. We did travel around, um, but I didn't really seem to be advancing and doing very much. Um, and then my wife got a job in the French Foreign Service, and she was posted of all places in Perth. So I came in 19, 1996, was it? 96, that's right. 1996, we came back and we settled in Perth. And because she was paid quite well, I said to her that I wanted to do an MBA. So I did my MBA at Murdoch University. And that was the next reset. That was the fifth reset in 1996. I should have mentioned that. Um, and so we finished the European side of things and here we are back in Australia, in Perth, whole new life, all new friends, doing all things different. And I was seriously wanting to get into business. However, when I finished my MBA at the end of 97, I noticed that I really liked teaching. I started teaching a little in France. I started teaching English. And here I had the opportunity of teaching business after doing my business degree. So we did that up and, and she was stationed there for about four years. And then in 2000, we left because I couldn't find any work that I wanted to do in Australia. And at this stage, I started getting disappointed again because I thought I really wanted to get into business because I'd done an MBA and I thought that was all I had to do. And I was a bit frustrated. And because I couldn't really find a job, my wife was off, offered a second post in Amsterdam. And so we decided to go to Amsterdam in 2000. That's the sixth reset. So we went to Amsterdam, almost just both of us drifting along. She went there because I didn't have a job and they'll give us, they gave her a second position. Um, I went with her and I got a, a few jobs in, um, in Amsterdam over the 12 years we were there. And this is when I was really just coasting along. Although while we were in Amsterdam, we learnt a lot, we travelled a lot, we met a lot of different people. I worked for many different companies. I even worked for American companies. I went from being a salesperson in a logistics company to a sales and consultant, salesperson and consultant for leadership development companies, going back into my dream of becoming a teacher, an educator. I worked for the Center for Creative Leadership started that in 2008 and then I started working for Harvard Business School amazingly in 2009-2010 uh, and I thought that would be um, that would make things a bit more interesting but I just started becoming a bit frustrated and throughout all this frustration I just ended up escaping through learning new things and trying new things and while I was searching and looking for something to do. I ended up doing a lot of things which were um, on the face of it quite meaningful and extremely interesting but I was always frustrated mainly because I wasn't doing exactly what I wanted to do. So I still had in the core of myself a love for music. I stopped playing music, a love for writing, I stopped really writing, um, a love for new ideas and philosophy which I sort of kept up by reading um, but um, and uh, that's that takes us all the way to the seventh reset in 2012 when we came back to Australia. So I decided to come back to Australia and I brought my second wife with me. Uh, our marriage was okay, it was a bit just drifting along. She stopped becoming uh, a French foreign diplomat and just got jobs in Amsterdam. I got her a job in the same company I was working at for a while. Um, but I was able to get a job um, as a leadership development consultant at the University of New South Wales at the Australian Graduate School of Management in 2012, and that's gave us, that gave us the impetus to come back. Now, um, what was I going to say? Having said that, um, I did really want to add thinking about my career, which I didn't really, I haven't really spoken too much about it until now, but in, I would say, my first real job that I had, the one that I really was, you know, put on for my professional, you know, asymmetry of knowledge, the knowledge that, that I had that I can bring to the job, was in 1997. So I was born in 1961. So I was 36 before I did, had my first real bona fide serious job. 
and um, I just thought I'd add that in. And so I'd only been working for about 12 years at that stage, no, 14 years, 15 years. Um, but I started coming closer to what I'd like doing. So I started getting really interested in coaching, leadership development, but on the content side. So that means becoming a true consultant, not just a um, a salesperson stroke consultant. So in other words, not, instead of looking for business, I would actually deliver on business and become a coach, a mentor, or a teacher. And so I enrolled at uh, Murder, uh, sorry, the University of Wollongong in their Master of Business um, coaching. Um, but what had happened, the first year in being back in Australia, um, my then wife wasn't very happy with coming back. She was a bit frustrated and we ended up breaking up. And it was a very messy breakup, um, although it ended up being amicable in the end. Um, she is still in Australia and um, she's still in Sydney. I am in contact with her from time to time. But I ended up meeting uh, my third wife and my current wife, and I'm very happy to be with my current wife. And I think this is really the first time I felt really content and happy with somebody, somebody who is a real, who, who is a real soulmate and somebody I can really relate to on an equal basis. Um, I think sometimes when you enter relationships very young, you look for an ideal, an object, um, and then you realize that going forward in life, you really want to be with somebody who's a human being who can relate to you. That might sound really trite, but that was the, the journey I was on relationship-wise. So, um, so since 2012, I finished my Master of Business Coaching. Um, by that stage, just to let you know, let's have a look first of all. Let's just pause there. I did a Bachelor of Arts at the University of Sydney. Then I did two degrees in France, French degrees, which were equivalent to master's degrees. I then came back and did a fourth degree, a master of business administration at Murdoch University. And then I did a fifth degree at the University of Wollongong, my master of business coaching. So I've done quite a, a lot of degrees. Now, I had been coaching and doing business coaching and uh, um, sessional lecturing, um, both at the um, University of New South Wales, at the Australian um, College of Applied Psychology here in Sydney, um, and working with senior executives. It was quite nice and I enjoyed it. But what I really, so, you know, I enjoyed the fact that, you know, I was able to, you know, use new ideas and learn and keep the self development going and create and write stuff. Um, still wasn't playing that much music. I started playing a little bit more recently. Um, but what I, one of the main themes that I loved and I was still frustrated in was building up my love for being an entrepreneur or running a business. So strangely, I decided in 2016 to become a financial planner, which is what I am now. And it wasn't because I love financial planning and nothing else but I thought it would be a great base or springboard for me to do something which would be truly entrepreneurial. I didn't think I could do it purely as a coach. Most coaches, um, even though they are their own business, they usually get contractual work um, and you're at the mercy of, you know, whatever the, the contract, whoever, what it, whoever the contract is able to, to use as a coach and whoever they have as a client. So the contractors could be the, University of New South Wales, it could be Melbourne Business School, Mount Eliza, it could be, um, you know, um, a private um, leadership development organization uh, in Australia or, or from overseas. So I didn't want to do that. I wanted to really have my own business and really run it the way I wanted to run it. So I became a financial planner. And as time went on, I I did that. I went through all the, all the learning. I'm still doing some some learning, some courses I need to do to become fully compliant. I am fully compliant, but um, I think every financial planner in Australia now, um, post Hain Royal Commission, has to do some further university study, which I've got about two or three subjects I need to do to complete that. But what I did was, is that when my mother passed away, um, I did inherit some money, and so I was able to buy a book of business in 2019, and and I called it Green Hills Wealth Management. And so since then, 
Um, I have been running that business and just getting to learn the ropes and how to run my own business um, and do everything that needs to be done. And being on the other side, I was coaching for many years in helping small business people. Um, I was at the uh, Business Enterprise Center um, in uh, the Sutherland Shire, helping small businesses um, uh, on behalf of the New South Wales government. So here I was on the other side actually running a business. One thing I always knew is that um, the traditional way of running a financial planning business is really unsustainable. Um, you really need to be delivering value, not just selling products and getting trailing commissions from them. Um, and so this is where I am at the moment. Um, and so they're, they're the sort of seven resets um, I've had. Now, so I've changed countries one, two, three, four, four times. So five times you count Perth as a different, Western Australia is a separate country. Different friends, different groups of people. With my current wife, got a whole new bunch of friends. Um, my current wife had a child. She was a widow. She is a widow. And so I inherited a, um, a child. Um, I don't feel comfortable out calling that, calling Dylan my son. I suppose he sort of is in a way. But that was a learning experience. But anyway, so my life has been very, very fragmented. Um, and even trying to put these uh, seven resets as a, a type of lattice or framework on which to hang the narrative, it still comes out very disjointed and very fragmented. Um, however, deep down, what are the things that really keep me going and, um, and basically keep me fragmented in a way? <laughs> Um, and that is, I really hate um, routine and getting stuck in a, in a rut. I do like structure and a solid foundation with anything that I do, but it's something that you build upon and change. So, for example, when I was doing leadership programs, there are always two types of leadership programs. There is the leadership programs that have been designed and then you invite people to come to them. They're like open programs. And then there are the custom programs that you go into companies, for example, um, or government organizations, and you do a custom program based on their company culture or whatever they're trying to achieve. And I've always been one for the custom program, starting from scratch, having a, a zero-based accounting for each new project. So that's um, my approach in life has always been like that, is always to um, start from scratch. Um, I, I don't really mind starting from scratch each time for each new client, for each new phase of my life because it's something new and I've always loved this idea of starting something new and doing something new. Um, one of my favorite poems is by an Australian poet called John Tranter and it's called Ode to Cole Joy. It's a funny poem and if you know who Cole Joy is, look him up. Um, he's an Australian country musician and it's basically a poem. It's about the poet John Tranter trying to find something new to write about and you get sick and tired of writing about deep things and art and life and love and death and whatever poets write about that's very significant. And he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write about, this morning I'm going to write about an Australian country and western singer, Cole Joy, because it's new. It's just something new and it's fresh. And when I read that line, it just, that touches something in me. The idea of getting up in the morning, today is something new, something fresh. Now, that may seem a bit flippity gibbet and but it's really um, that really sums me up pretty much. I love new ideas. I love philosophy. I love talking about philosophical things with people. I love music and about music. What I really love is not sitting down learning a piece of music, learning how to play Stairway to Heaven, note for note. It's improvising. I love jamming and doing something new and picking up the guitar or picking up music and keyboard and doing something completely new. And that filters through to everything. And in business, that's very hard to do. And I wish I could do that. And something that I would like doing, something that's, that's my own, something which is unique. Um, and I think it's taken me almost 40 years to realize all that. I think I sort of knew that before. But one of the things that I battle within is really self-doubt. Self-doubt is a big thing. Um, and if I encounter anybody who has a bullying attitude along the way, whether it be an adult bully or um, the situation is bullying me, I tend to run away. So 
running away is always a um, was always a happy solution for me. Um, happy solution. Um, that never works as a solution. I've never been able to really, um, you know, face up to things that needed to be facing up to. Um, I think I've built resilience over the years, just by sheer age. Um, now, some people say, George, you're not able to stick things out. Um, and that's maybe very, very true. However, I do have um, a good track record with things that I like doing and have continued to do. Um, but anyway, I, I don't really take a linear path in things. So um, I can talk about all the other things that I've done in my life and all the things that, that um, um, I fail at a lot of things. It doesn't really bother me failing. I sort of get bothered by it when I think, geez, I don't have that much in super, do I? <laughs> um, oh, my bank accounts are looking that crash off. Um, but that's just, you know, the safety level on the, uh, you know, the Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. <laughs> um, you know, I think of that for maybe a whole five seconds and go, oh, maybe I should have, you know, done something like that. Um, I went to get a root canal um, done recently and the periodontist was somebody who went to school. I went to school with, I didn't realize that until I was sitting in the chair. And he left school, became a dentist uh, in the early 80s. Oh, he went to dental school, became a dentist, and he's become a very successful and well-off periodontist. And I look at him, I thought I could have done that. And I sort of think, which I would have done that, perhaps. But then I thought, nah, then all the other things I would have missed out. And all the things that I know and all the things that I've experienced and all the places that I've been, all the different things that I've done, um, all those experiences, um, I would say that I'm extremely rich in that. And it's just now I'm beginning to realize that. When I encounter people like the periodontist who, you know, maybe went overseas once or twice and um, built up a lot of wealth and built up a great periodontic uh, practice in the middle of Sydney. and <laughs> um, But anyway, so uh, that's, you know, I, I don't have any regrets. So... At my age now, I'm 60, and so I think if I don't do what I really want to do now, I won't ever do it. So, um, and so, I really am going to sort of say, not worry about it, not not give in to any fears or anything like that, not be bullied by the circumstances, and really try it. And so far, it's been great. Um, I don't know what else to say, actually. Um, usually, I think I prefer you asking me questions. So that's it. Um, seven resets. Maybe I could have given more, but I thought seven is one of those nice biblical numbers. Um, uh, just to recap, um, everything I've come to to do now has been purely trial and error. Um, I've tried a lot of things, and I've been good at a lot of things, but I've never never gone ahead with them. Um, I was really good at Latin at school, but I didn't go ahead with that. Um, I did really well at um, economics and statistics at university. I never pursued that. I still pursue it a little bit now when I'm helping um, Dylan, who's first year university. <laughs> um, I just try and remember the things that I've learned to help him out. But I really like business and uh, I like the idea, of, uh, the idea of being entrepreneurial. Um, when I'm able to help my clients, I really get into the flow and I feel not just happy, but eudaimonically happy, if you know what that means. It's, there's, there's a sort of surface happiness, being happy, and then there's a deep contentment and satisfaction called eudaimonia, um, which comes from, I suppose, Aristotle. And that is the thing that I really love. Um, if, a, if I'm able to help a client and do something meaningful for them, um, and Look, I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm not a charitable person. I shouldn't say that. But when I get to really help my clients, I really feel, okay, there's a lot of meaning and purpose that's created there. Um, I'm a bit ambivalent about trying to find meaning in your life. I'd rather have something that's ahead of me. To, I, I, having a purpose is different from having a meaning. Having a purpose means you get to go and do something and aim for something. Meaning means what's all this about? So I'm more of a purpose person, not a meaning person. Um, and I think that having my own business, doing that successfully, if I'm able to help somebody on a very, on a deeper level and help them and 
if they become a raving fan of mine, great. But if I've really helped them and they appreciate it by remaining my client, I'm over the moon. Um, I love new ideas. I love educating. Educating is a, is a favorite form of the way I sell. Um, I, I love creating something. I love doing my own newsletters. I love writing stuff. I still very philosophical. I still listen to philosoph philosophy podcasts. And I've been playing a lot of guitar lately. And so one of the things I want to do this year is maybe start playing music with another person. That'd be wonderful. Um, so that's it. Um, if you find this really boring, sorry. <laughs> um, but um, look, if there's anything that I've missed out, I may let you know. Um, but I think I've told you everything I wanted to say. I don't know if it came out really well, but um, that's me.